Last week, I began to explore one of the classic refuges in Buddhism, that of the teacher. And uh, we approached this topic altogether of refuge in turbulent times, surrounded by challenges outside of us, other challenges arising inside us. And when things are challenging, uh, and especially when they're really challenging, it's particularly helpful to find refuge of one kind or another. Places, people, activities, teachings, ideas, inspiration that gives us a sense of protection, support, refueling, and inspiration really, really broadly. So refuges. And one of the things I talked about last time in terms of the refuge of teachers is the capacity to be appropriately ambivalent, to recognize complexity in those who have been teachers or benefactors or mentors or of use to us, including our friends and our partners, even our own children, to recognize complexity there so that we can identify those qualities in them that we do want to model or we do want to take in, maybe we want to emulate, while leaving out the other parts that are not so relevant to us or even potentially problematic. And if we think about, for example, key figures in our lives, parents, perhaps significant spiritual teachers, coaches, guides, uh, people we looked up to, being able to see them in their complexity as a kind of mosaic and being able to see those qualities in them that we do find useful and beneficial while not feeling that they're contaminated or negated somehow by those other aspects of the individual that are either neutral or problematic being able to give yourself the right to do that and the freedom to do that, to sort what you actually do want to listen to, what you do want to respect, what you do want to get value from, while bowing and maybe saying goodbye to the rest, that is wonderfully freeing. It means that we don't have to give up on what is beneficial from key figures in our life just because there are other qualities that were not so beneficial at all. That's wonderfully freeing. And so that's kind of a framework for me being able now to do a kind of a, and to offer a, a fairly brief summary of the Buddha's own life with some lessons I think for us today. And uh, I offer this not out of um, raising the Buddha up as an object of worship, because he did not represent himself in that way. He represented himself essentially as a teacher, as a coach, as someone who, by their own example, has developed and trained and has something to offer uh, from their own training and background and realization that others should judge on its merits and not take on authority alone, not take on faith alone, but to observe over time and see what has the ring of truth and what seems personally useful. That's how he represented himself, and that's how I'll, I'll try to describe him too. Uh, I invite you into this topic by asking yourself a little bit, or just kind of looking back on or reflecting on, what's your own journey in this life? What got you here right now even? What suffering brought you along the way that you wanted to address? What larger sense of possibility in this life maybe moved you, has moved you in your own journey, your own healing, your own personal growth, your own explorations? Just kind of look back, what's, what's motivated you? Um, I'll uh, share two maybe three kind of key for me, just as, a, as an invitation for you. One is that when I was very young, 
in the background of most of my memories, almost all my memories as a child, was a kind of wistful, poignant sense of lots of unnecessary unhappiness around me. I didn't understand it deeply. I was just three years old, five, seven. But it seemed that there was a lot of stressing and fussing and quarreling and worrying and hassling and bothering that just, I didn't understand it. I saw that in the adults with each other. I saw that in the kids with each other. And I saw that in people, how people were with me. And I saw myself getting into it too sometimes. Like, why? I didn't understand it. And I wanted to understand it. A second major thing was that by the time I was a teenager, I was really quite unhappy. I wasn't abused. I wasn't traumatized. But boy, I was pretty unhappy. And I didn't want to be unhappy. And I wanted to figure out how to be less unhappy. And it came to me over a period of days in kind of a revelation that I could help myself learn to be happy. I could help myself learn to be less bothered by things, more skillful with others, less awkward. Uh, I could help myself. And I had a sense with that in the teaching that's in the Buddha's last words that I began with a couple of classes ago, if we call these classes, a couple evenings ago, um, Buddha's last words being, things fall apart, tread the path with care. Or as it was a kind of originally translated more poetically, be a lamp unto yourself. So that, those two kind of deep emotional memories, you know, woven into my background, really kind of set me on my way. Uh, and you too may be able to look back on your own journey with both that sense of suffering broadly and also a movement inside you to be relieved of it and to not just be numb or relieved of suffering, but to find some kind of lasting true happiness. Lasting true love, lasting contentment, you know, as someone is writing right now, Marina, shelter from suffering. We find much the same in the Buddha's own journey as best we can know about a life that was lived 2,500 or so years ago. Even the exact dates of his life are still a little uncertain. As best we can gather, the individual who became the Buddha and the Buddha simply means one who knows, one who understands. Buddha means the knowing, the capacity to be wakeful and to see without ignorance or delusion, the knowing capacity in us all. And one way also to understand this fundamental refuge um, is not just in terms of individuals that we um, can respect and appreciate, look up to and learn from, over there, outside us, but the teacher within. The knowing, the intuition, the aspiration within us all. The one who knows within us. The knowing, the Buddha, the Buddha nature, in the sense of it, that is within us all. Maybe covered over, maybe we have fl flashes of it that don't yet have continuity, but still within us too. So. As best we know, the individual who became known as the Buddha, the one who knows, Gautama Siddhartha, was essentially born into a, a, a band, a clan, in northern India about 2,500 years ago. His family was relatively affluent. They were high caste Brahmins, so a life of relative privilege. And being male, definitely, privileged in the patriarchal, feudal structure of the time. At some point, the Buddha, right around age 29, and I'll call him the Buddha. Actually, I'll use a different name. I'll call him Gautama. So right around age 29, as a youngish man, but in early middle age, Gautama, living a life, a conventional life of hunting and farming and, you know, being affiliated with other clans, 
uh, walked away from all of it. Right around the time his only child, his son, uh, was born. And uh, last time I think I talked about this, how do we understand this? He abandoned his family. He went forth to pursue his own awakening. And we can understand this in the norms of his time. We can understand it as well in our own time, the norms of our own time. However we understand it, the fact remains that on the eve of his own, of his child's birth, he walked away from his wife and his son and his family. And probably long periods of time passed before anyone knew whether he was alive or not. The very self-oriented act. Now, it was a self-oriented act or a personally oriented act that has served many people, millions of people in the centuries since, but still, there was that saying, I'm going to explore for myself, regardless of the consequences for others. And I think it's easy sometimes to turn that into some sort of noble quest. And I think it's also, even though we don't know for sure, for me at least, it's, it's actually useful to think of the Buddha ambivalently, to recognize his complexity, and to also recognize that he was situated in his time and place. Um, I try to imagine sometimes, what if Gautama were a, were a woman? What if Gautama were a woman and a mother rather than a man and a father in that time? In the structure of his time, it's almost unimaginable because of the place of, of women in that time. And so his privilege as a male, um, identified in that way, uh, enabled him to go forth. He would not have had that option had he been a woman. And I think these are things to understand and to take into account. And so he taught from that privilege. He taught from that perspective. He taught from his own background, trained in the educational trainings that were available to Brahmins. Uh, he, he came from that place. And so whatever he taught is, of course, in some sense, framed by his own background. The things that he taught about that we can recognize as seemingly factual, seemingly true, um, you know, uh, can have some kind of fundamental truth, right? The fundamental equation, you know, the area of a circle is pi r squared, right? Uh, that has some fundamental truth to it. And yet the communication of that truth, the framing of that truth, and who gets to teach that truth is situated in a culture. Me. You can be ambivalent about me. I too, like all teachers, am situated in my own place, in, which in my case includes privileges in many, many regards and challenges in other regards. Um, we can't help but teach from our own place. For me then, the question becomes, as we approach teachers, this first of several refuges I hope to explore with you in the weeks to come, um, we can ask, do they seem sincere? Are they sincere? Are they consistent? Are they authentic uh, in what they're, what they're doing? Is there a genuine motivation in them that can be discerned to be helpful to others? And are they part of a feedback process that, in which they themselves learn along the way? I've had teachers, I've known people who were teachers who, upon inspection over time, were not so sincere. There was something false and inauthentic about them. And that's a big warning flag. Also, I've had teachers who were insulated from feedback loops. No one dared to challenge them. They did not take feedback. They did not learn and grow. And so the larger systems that they were part of became increasingly contaminated with that which was unsaid or unsayable or not allowed to be sayable. So I think feedback is very, very, very important. I try to be open to your feedback, whether it's about the gain on my microphone, or what I'm talking about. When we look at the Buddha's own life, as best again we can gather, um, he, you know, I think I would use the word selfish. 
in his initial movement away from his family and his own self-centered preoccupations with his own suffering and with his own development on the one hand. On the other hand, it does seem certainly that he was dedicated and sincere in his roughly seven years or so of training, uh, you know, wandering through northern India, penniless, ascetic, emaciated, doing practices, deep renunciate practices, very painful austerities, training in various meditative disciplines, seeking out intense teachers of his time and learning what they had to teach him. Um, and then after his awakening in particular, when he could have just wandered off into the jungle and hung out by himself <laughs> in a solitary way, uh, he then, as best we can gather, very sincerely, and I'm sure with a certain amount of hassle, <laughs> uh, taught for nearly 40 years after his awakening. And seemingly, during that time, amidst his own sincerity as a teacher, he learned. He modified his teachings in various ways. After some initial resistance, he brought women into the monastic order of practitioners. Uh, he would uh, offer guidelines for people in general and monastics in particular that then people would bring problems to him about. And he would say, oh, got to revise that, got to approach things differently in, in, in the codes we have for the monastics and, and our guidance for, for, for lay practitioners, householders. It wasn't perfect. Uh, one sign of those imperfections are that there are many more rules uh, in the Theravadan tradition of Buddhism for women monastics uh, than there are for men monastics. So, we're still trying to shake off the legacy of patriarchy in that regard. And still, there was a certain amount of feedback. And, and I think we could say that in his own way, uh, the Buddha shifted and, and learned and, and received input of various kinds. So in that frame then, in which we are allowed to see complexity, to be ambivalent, and which enables us actually to really appreciate what has value over time. Uh, in our in teachers, um, after the Buddha wandered around looking for the ultimate happiness, it's interesting to appreciate that what sent him on his way may have been true. It's come down to us as a kind of myth, kind of story, that in his fairly privileged life he encountered four beings who are described as messengers divine messengers even, in the broadest, loosest sense of the word divine. And one of the messengers was someone who was sick. A second messenger, a second teacher, was someone who was very old, very aged and infirm. A third divine teacher messenger was a corpse, someone who was dead. And the fourth divine messenger was a wandering spiritual practitioner, a dedicated practitioner. And so here too, we can ask ourselves in this life, including right now as a plague, is actually gathering. We haven't seen the full force of this storm yet. It's like a gathering storm still um, in terms of its consequences, all of its consequences. Uh, in this time, it's really powerful and profound to reflect on what it might be like to take refuge in the inevitability of illness to stare it squarely in the face and how that can be, how that clear seeing of illness and frailty, fragility can be a kind of refuge. Uh, in the weekly newsletter I send out freely, this week is embrace fragility. It can be kind of a refuge to stop resisting the fact that we are vulnerable in all kinds of ways. We are vulnerable through the blessing and amazingness of the human body 
through a mortal life, we are vulnerable to illness. We are vulnerable to aging. <laughs> you may have heard the joke, who in the world would want to be 100 years old? Someone who's 99. <laughs> We hope. I hope to have my. I hope to have had my father's health problems in his ninety sixth year, before he finally passed away, just short of his ninety seventh birthday. So aging, and we are vulnerable to death. All that is subject to arising is subject to passing away. Things fall apart, as the Buddha taught in his last words. Tread your own path with care. Bring heart to it. Bring conscientious to it and bring a learning to it that recognizes what's working and not working and, and learns again. And last, can we take refuge in the possibility of practice, the fourth divine messenger, the possibility of our own practice, and can we take refuge in the sincerity of our motivations for practice? Can you look back on your own journey and see these messengers? See them at work, including the sincerity of your own motivations. Maybe it's fitful. For me, there were long periods in my life. There have been long periods where I was super flaky, if not anti-practice. <laughs> you know, going in the wrong direction, zigging and zagging, floundering, sinking. We had these times. We had these periods often. Uh, very few people have a straight shot at enlightenment. Okay, But still, as a kind of through line, as a thread running through all of that, can you find your own motivation, your own sincere interest for practice, much as the Buddha did? So we have these four teachers that we can take refuge in. It's really quite profound. Taking refuge in the inherent vulnerability and not resisting it. Being skillful and prudent and you know capable for others and for ourselves and what we do about, you know, minimizing illness, aging well, facing death wisely, having hopefully a, a, a fairly peaceful death, inevitably. We can help ourselves in those ways and we can also help ourselves to honor that movement in us that is wise and wakeful, the Buddha within us, who knows the way it is and is taking steps and honoring the yearning in your heart for a higher happiness. Also in the Buddhist journey, I want to call out two other things and then open it up for your own discussion here. <clears throat> One is the Buddha lived in a time in which there was a lot of emphasis on ritual and a kind of priest class who would perform rituals for people and improve their odds of having a better life you know, in the next rebirth, given the frame of reincarnation that they, in which they thought. And the Buddha said, no, deeds alone you know, do, do not make a person, um, empty ritual does not make a person holy. What makes a person truly holy are volitional, deliberate, intentional acts of thought, word, and deed. So it's not just lighting the fire and going through mumbling some ritualistic prayer that um, helps us. It's, it's not about the empty act itself. It's about the intention behind it. What is the sincerity? What is the intention behind our conduct? And even if other not so positive, not so beneficial attention, intentions arise, you know, people do things, they step on your toe. Um, you know, these weird intentions arise, you know, in the complex cave of the mind. All right, fine. But then can we gather ourselves fairly soon and find a wholesome intention, a beneficial intention? Can we kind of, and, and can we, you know, take our stand there? Can we listen to the better angels of our own nature rather than giving over to those other forces, right? Intention. That's really fundamental. You know, and I think it really shows up in where the rubber meets the road, right? When we're interacting with other people. And, you know, 
They say something, they do something. Well, boom, now it's your turn. What's the intention behind your turn? Before you reply, before you send a post on Facebook, before you say your words, before you move your body in some way that reveals your attitude, what's your intention? Is your intention fundamentally benign, constructive, even if it's kind of messy and a little ragged in how you express it? But deep down, does it come from a good heart? Is there good heartedness in your intention? Right? Or on the other hand, are you coming from ill will? Are you coming from the movement to harm yourself or others? It's interesting that um, in the Eightfold Path, there are these elements, wise view or right view. Uh, right intention is typically listed second after right view. And right intention consists of basically the intention not to get attached to pleasures and also the intention not to harm others. And in particular, the intention not to have ill will, the will for ill rather than good will. We can take refuge in our intentions. You know, we can take refuge in our own sincerity and ask ourselves what is what are what are our intentions. And then the other thing I just want to kind of call out here is that um, the Buddha really emphasized the value of good company. He had companions himself in his spiritual journey. He sought out teachers. He appreciated community. And when he began to teach himself, one of the things that he really emphasized was gathering in community and learning from each other and doing things that promote the common good. At this time of physical distancing, at this time in which our um, public institutions can be really challenged, particularly in different countries, it's more important than ever to appreciate the common good and to look for those ways that support the common good, such as gathering together here in a kind of digital commons, a kind of virtual commons, Yahoo, uh, I see there, um, all together. You might ask yourself here, where do you find good company? And is there anything for you to recognize in your own finding a good company? including the internalization of the good company of those who are models for you, at least in some regards, who have qualities you'd like to emulate. You'd like to rest your mind upon the qualities in others with, with whom you find good company so that increasingly your own being can take that shape, increasingly established in that way of being. Okay. I invite you, if you like, to learn more about the Buddha's life. Um, a wonderful book. Yeah, somewhere. Here we go. A Meditator's Life of the Buddha. If you're looking for something to read, uh, I've dog-eared about every other page because it's full of value. It's by the monk Analio, Bhikkhu Analio. A Meditator's Life of the Buddha. What's interesting about it is that it's historically really well done with good scholarship. And Analio, who's a deep practitioner, um, very gifted as a teacher, walks through the Buddha's own journey uh, as a way to teach, uh, you know, to flag in, uh, important points as we ourselves walk in the footsteps of those we, we respect and, and want to learn from. A Meditator's Life of the Buddha. Okay. I'd like to reply uh, to a few questions that have come in already, wonderful questions coming in. Um, I'll say first that the drawing on the wall behind me, which I should have kind of posted routinely, is from the artist Brad Montague. And uh, what it says essentially is a backpack I carried for way too long. And it includes things like self-doubt, shame and guilt, stuff I believed about who I am, fears, desire for approval, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what that is. Okay, so let's see here. Uh, 
I'm just quickly scanning. Um, okay. So many, many wonderful questions here. Uh, Okie doke. Wow, wonderful. You might like to read um, uh, some of the questions that have come in and some of the comments that have come in. So I think what I'd like to do is zero in on a couple of key topics that have come in. So uh, from Becky, uh, hi Becky. Uh, Becky writes, our intentions can get tangled up with emotions that may mean a well-intended statement or deed can come across with frustration. Totally true. Um, that doesn't usually play out well. I'm dealing with trying to get a former landlord to fulfill his legal obligation, and it's frustrating. Trying to navigate that communication without just allowing him to cause harm to me as a result of his neglect. Okay. A lot in that. Um, what's interesting about the Buddha, it, to go back to that, to use him as a bit as an example, is that people would come to him and they would try to do you know, combat with him, dharma combat, they would try to debate him, and other people would come to him less philosophically, but they would be engaged in some kind of practice. And he did not hold back what he actually thought. He was really quite direct, and he would unpack what people were saying, and he'd say, look, this doesn't seem true. There are these contradictions in what you're, you're saying here, da, da 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 There are actually some interchanges which began with him saying, oh, foolish man. Uh, and uh, as, as it turned out, uh, you know, these dialogues were, again, in the time entirely with men and that have come down to us at least. Although a number of the most profound teachings that are available to us today inside what's called the Pali Canon, the surviving written record of the teachings of the Buddha, his contemporaries, and his immediate successors. Some of the most profound of them come from, from female teachers, female monastics that are really quite remarkable. And in some of the weeks to come, I want to draw on that material more, including to broaden out you know, what I'm presenting myself. So he was really quite direct. He was prepared to say it. And I think it's useful to ask ourselves when we communicate, um, what are the criteria for wise speech, which you may well have heard before? Is it, you know, um, well intended? Is it true? Is it actually useful? Is it timely? And is it communicated without harsh tone? So even when the Buddha was saying, oh, foolish man, for him, that wasn't harsh tone. That was just, oh, four legged dog. <laughs> You know, oh, foolish man, <laughs> clearly foolish here, da 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 da. And then uh, sixth optional but desirable criterion is, is it wanted? And sometimes we have things to say to people that are not wanted. And then um, what I think is very useful is to ask ourselves, okay, is what I'm saying well-intended? If only for my benefit, it may not be for their benefit. They may not be benefited by the legal claim I'm filing here. They may not be benefited by the ways I'm serving notice to them or confronting them with their broken agreement. And still, at least there's a positive, wholesome intent here uh, based on principle, based on what is reasonable and legitimate for myself as I get to decide. There are good intentions behind it. And is the tone clean? I ask myself, if I were to come back and to read this, or if neutral people were to read this, would they think that I've just gone over the top? Or uh, I sometimes imagine that a video camera is recording my interactions with others, and the, the recording will be played at my kids' weddings, or at my memorial service eventually when I pass away myself, that, or at the Board of Psychology. <laughs> <laughs> in some kind of hearing, uh, or on national television, <laughs> maybe. You know, how do you want to be, right? And one thing I notice about people that have a lot of moral authority, there's a lot of weight, uh, they bring it, you know. Uh, they don't tend to add a lot of stuff, right? And that forces others to really face what they're saying rather than being able to distract or get caught up in side issues. You know, ask yourself, can you be dignified, grounded, claiming moral authority, 
you know, with a gravity, not sputtering, which I think is the terrible middle. You know, either don't say it at all or say it in a way that counts. But to be caught up in that middle region where we kind of sputter and fume and we're, we're in the worst of both worlds. We're caught up in contentiousness and difficulty with others while not really bringing it home, what it is we actually really, really have to say. And then ultimately, I'll finish on this point, we communicate for ourselves, independent of what they do, whether they agree, they disagree, they like it, they dislike it, they get persuaded, they change what they're doing inside their mind, you know. We communicate for ourselves so that we discover our truth along the way, so that we know we were brave enough to speak it, speak truth to power if it's appropriate to do. We feel good about ourselves. We serve notice. They know that we know that they know what we have said. Um, but ultimately, we're free. They're going to do whatever they do. They need to tread their own path with care. Meanwhile, we tread our own. And there's a kind of refuge in that, in that freedom to know that you've offered um, the best you can and they do what they do. Yeah. Okay. So let's see other people. Well, what do you think about the Buddha? Are you interested in his life? You don't have to. I mean, it's not about worshiping him or setting him up. And it's really like, oh, you know, what what can we learn from him? I'll say something here from Lubko. If your intention is to seek the truth, can it still be destructive and hurtful? Yeah. And this gets very interesting. So if I follow you right, um, our own truth we see can make others really uncomfortable. And this gets very interesting. You know, by what right do we make others uncomfortable? And a way I think about this ethically and morally is that I would not wish for a world in which other people were not entitled to pursue their own self-interest in ways that were not over the line, as it were. In other words, in... I would want them to be able to pursue their self-interest as long as they did not kill other people and hopefully had less of a harmful footprint on the planet altogether, including non-human beings. Um, I would wish for them to be able to pursue their self-interest as long as they don't steal or lie or you know, harm others through intoxicants or through sexuality, right? I'd wish for them to have that opportunity to compete in the marketplace, even though knowing that, um, and, I, and I would wish to have those rights myself. So that people applying for a job are competing for a job. People who are opening a restaurant are competing with other restaurants. People who want to form a partnership, you know, to, to, to be a partner with, a, a mate with another person, that may block out other people from becoming a mate with that person. I would want them to have that right in much the same way. Therefore, I need to have that right for myself. So yeah, so uh, if we pursue our own self-interest without crossing lines, sometimes it makes other people uncomfortable. Sometimes we succeed in ways that involve their failure in some sense, particularly if we're competing for scarce resources. And so at the end of the day, the real question is, did we do so honorably? Were we pursuing wholesome ends with wholesome means while being in some ways at peace with the result? 
And so, yeah, sometimes when we pursue the truth, that leads other people to be uncomfortable, um, including times when we pursue the truth of holding them to moral account. And then we have to ask ourselves, what's our deep intention behind doing that? I would say my own pra- I'll finish on this one point and then see if there's one question or comment from a person and get your voice in the room here. Uh, a longtime therapist in my case, so maybe it was a selected population of people who came to see a therapist, but I would say for uh, the one person who was very selfishly pursuing their own agenda and running roughshod on other people, there were nine other people or maybe 19 other people who were not backing their own play, who were not on their own side, who were not really, really honoring um, the longings and the aspirations that they had and really sticking up for themselves. So yeah, be careful about, you know, I'm gonna use some technical language here. Don't be a selfish asshole. Duh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> so, you know, fine. And on the other side of it, hey, are you back in your own play? Are you speaking up about what's important for you in your relationships? Are you going, are you supporting your own dreams, including your own aspirations for realization in this life and personal development? Okay. Which is the bigger problem? I think for, Most people, you know, being aggressive jerks to others or not keeping faith with themselves, playing smaller than they really need to play. Okay, well, I am going to end on time, so I'm not going to be able to, um, (laughs) I see I'm being quoted here. (laughs) Thanks, Dan. Anyway, um, I'm going to end on time. And so I invite you to take a last minute here, quietly together, and just let tonight sink in. And then I'll ring the bell three times and we'll come to a formal ending. And then if you want, stick around to be sorted into breakout rooms at 35 minutes past the hour. What's one thing that has touched you today? in this gathering, maybe in the meditation, maybe in my talk. Is there a feeling? Is there an insight that can land in you? The combination of warm-heartedness and calm, peacefulness and caring together. Very interesting exploration. In your core, way down deep, a peaceful lovingness, a warm-hearted peacefulness. The combination, the mingling of the two coloring your consciousness is something you might like to explore. It's been a real exploration for me. May you be well, and I hope to see you next week. Bows to you. Bye-bye. Heart to you all as well.
Bye-bye, bye-bye. Farewell. May you fare well.